Okay, so where we left off with AMP1 was with the nervous system. And we basically went through the anatomy and we talked about moving an actual potential along the nerves. Uh, but we never really talked about generating an action potential at a sensory organ. Um, or the signals that can be generated for picking up pain signals or uh, pain stimuli or light from the eye or how the ear actually is going to take sound waves and convert them into verbal cues. So I want to I want to start with that. And so we're going to deal deal with the sensory system. And what you can see in this figure is just some example of a variety of um, sensory organs that we may find in the entire um, so, you know, you have things like temperature sensors, things that sense heat and cold, thermal, thermal receptors. And then you have these touch receptors, which are the Meisner corpuscles. So you have all of these embedded inside of different tissues, not just necessarily the skin, but in a variety of other tissues. They respond to stimuli, some sort of stimuli. So heat and cold or the sense of touch, the noce receptors sense pain. So if you get stabbed, that's going to be a signal generated by the noce receptor. And then those signals, those sensory organs are going to convert that mechanical perturbation into a electrical signal, an action potential that then will travel up the nerves into the nervous system. And you basically should have a pretty good concept of how all of that really works up there. So inside of our sensory system, we have two types of components. We have the sensory receptors, and so these are going to be anatomical elements that are going to basically be nerve endings. And so they're specialized receptors. And these specialized receptors, they've been designed to detect some sort of stimuli. And again, they're just simply going to be nerve endings. The second component that we may see is a little bit more formal and it's going to be a sensory organ. Now the sensory organ, it's not just simply this blind nerve ending, it's actually going to be specialized tissue. <clears throat> and these specialized tissues really end up being a composite. And that should be a term that you're familiar with already. What's a composite? Different materials. Yep, so two or more different materials that come together and they form a new material that kind of grabs onto the properties of the two individual materials. And the example I usually give is a fishing pole which is made out of epoxy and carbon fiber or epoxy and graphite. So you get something that's stiff but flexible. So the composite of a sensory organ is going to be a combination of the nervous system. So it can have, it has this really high uh, potential to respond to a stimuli. That's what nervous systems do. They respond and they do it really, really well as the neurons and nerve cells are going to do. So we gain that uh, attribute from the sensory or within the sensory organ. But then the composites with another tissue type. And that other tissue type often is going to be connective tissue. And so it gets embedded into this connective tissue, which is what you can see down here at the bottom. And so whenever that connective tissue has some sort of change, it is influencing the nervous system. So the nervous system responds to the stimuli the connective tissue or the other tissue in the composite of the sensory organ helps that perturbation or that 
stimuli to be amplified and recognized or, or uh, received. So down here, these are examples of these sensory organs, and you know we have things like the uh, the nerves that are embedded inside of tendons and um, or, or sensory organs embedded in the tendons and the muscles that help to relay information on the position of that muscle. Is it overly stretched? Is it overly contracted? You mean it's neither of those two? What is the stretch capacity and the stretch characteristics occurring within that muscle? So there are some general purposes. We've probably seen a figure like this, if not this exact same figure before. You can see that um, this moron has decided to stick his finger in a candle to see what happens, and he responds with a pain response to move his hand away from that stimuli. So the general purpose of a sensory organ or a sensory receptor is to transduct a stimuli. And it's going to move or transduct that stimuli to the nervous system by converting it into a nervous signal. Again, this is some sort of non-electrical, non-nervous stimuli. Right? In this case, it's heat. But it could be pressure. It could be uh, mechanical um, perturbation or something along those lines. In this case, it's heat. That heat is a stimuli that's then transduced or converted into a nervous signal to be moved into the central nervous system. That's basically the role and the purpose of these signal, um, these uh, sensory receptors and sensory organs, is to take one sensory input and convert it into an electrical signal that the nervous system can handle and utilize. So the example that I'm giving you here is just simply the conversion of heat or heat energy from a candle or a stove to a pain reflex. And that pain reflex is a nervous system signal and a nervous system response. Okay, so how do we take something like heat and convert it into that nervous system electrical signal? So what are the steps in the process? All right, so um, basically the same picture, just a little bit different here. we got a hot burner on the stove. And as you're all probably aware, when you put your hand on that hot burner on the stove, immediately you pull your hand away. Right? I mean, you don't sit down and pinch me most of the time. <laughs> so you put your hand on the stove, and the reaction is to move it away. So in that process, this happens, what I was trying to get at there, is this typically happens and you don't do it consciously. You're distracted because your little kids are running around, and you lean over and yell at them. When your hand touches that burner, that burner acts as a stimuli. That stimuli then is going to create the reaction. The reaction that we have is initially produced at the site of stimuli. Okay, so the first step in that reaction here is probably for a thermoreceptor to detect a massive change in heat. All of a sudden, we're going from room temperature to potentially 300 degrees centigrade, instantaneously. Now, that reaction that is created, now this is where you guys should really be able to pick up and where things should really start to make sense. What is most likely happening in that receptor or in that organ? 
as reactions create. Basically, I'm asking what is most likely that reaction to be? Just shout it out. Okay. Um, those are both really reasonable answers, but at the level of the sensor, that's that's a little bit further downstream. At the level of the sensor, what's happening in that sensor? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. We're probably generating some sort of local potential. We're converting that signal into an electrical signal, creating that characteristic action potential. Okay? This is specifically known as a receptor potential. Right? A receptor potential. So if we were to look at the membrane, we'll have some sort of protein. The heat comes in. As heat comes in, it causes what, ha what to happen to that protein. Lewis, you should know this. What happens whenever a protein interacts with something else? Changes form and function. So normally, it's not allowing ions through. Heat comes in, it allows ions through. Sodium rushes in. What happens to the voltage inside of the cell? It's going up. As the voltage inside of the cell goes up, we're now beginning to create that signal. Now, that signal is going to begin to move away from that sensory organ into the peripheral nervous system. And as it travels along the peripheral nervous system, it's traveling through some sort of conduction. Typically, it's going to be action potentials as part of saltatory conduction. So we have transduction or movement of that signal along a nerve pathway to the central nervous system. OK, so we have the stimuli that creates the reaction that starts in the sensory organ or the sensory receptor itself by generating a receptor potential. That receptor potential moves from the receptor or from the sensory organ into a peripheral nerve where it generates an action potential that moves along that neuron back to the central nervous system. Once it gets into the central, central nervous system, or well, before I get there, how it got there was through that action potential cascade. So the action potential cascade moves that signal along. When we get to the synapse, which eventually we're going to have to get to a synapse, probably leading into an inner neuron from the peripheral nerve to the inner neuron to the nerves of the central nervous system, what do you think is going to happen at that inner neuron? So we have a presynaptic cell, a postsynaptic cell. The action potential makes its way along, comes down to the synaptic knot. Calcium flushes into the cell, causes that neurotransmitter that's contained in the vesicle to dock up with the membrane, releases that neurotransmitter into the synaptic gap. That neurotransmitter crosses across the, uh, the synaptic gap to interact with the receptor on the postsynaptic side causing another action potential to get. So we go from an electrical signal to a chemical signal by releasing the neurotransmitter. How am I going to release that neurotransmitter? What form of bulk transport? Good night. Right? Yes. Exocytosis of a neurotransmitter. Now, we're talking about milliseconds for all this whole process to take place, right? So we've gone from receptor potential being created, action potential cascade moving along that peripheral nerve to the synapse. Synapse uh, releases the neurotransmitter into the synaptic gap, and then we generate another action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Eventually, we're going to have this signal end up somewhere in the central nervous system, uh, higher brain centers, 
or within the spinal cord, and we're going to have actual sensation. So up to this point, the milliseconds that it's taken for this to happen, there is still no feeling of pain, right? We have kind of this little leg period. Now we're going to be in the central nervous system, and we're going to have this sensation. This involves a sensing of the stimuli. Now, we have sensation of the stimuli that only occurs occasionally. And I'm going to kind of expand on this in just a second. Okay, so we're going to have a bunch of information that comes in, but only occasionally are stimuli that are being, uh, that are producing or causing this reaction, only occasionally are those stimuli going to be sensed. And there's two really good reasons that we do this. One, we don't want to overwhelm the central nervous system with all the information that's coming in. So the brain is going to filter the stimuli, and this is going to occur in the brainstem. Now the reason that we do that is because we just don't want to overwhelm our central nervous system with every little sensory input that comes in. We only want to interrupt the nervous system when it's really a noxious si signal that we need to get away from or that we need to shield from. Uh, the other reason that we're going to do this, that we're going to only occasionally uh, cause a stimuli to occur. If we had every little stimuli that was around us sending a reaction into the central nervous system, it would drive us absolutely nuts. You think about it, you put your clothes on in the morning, and you might know that you had your clothes on right after you put them on. But eventually, you don't have that constant signal of, oh, your shirt's on, your pants on. So we begin to filter out those sort of less important or less noxious signals so that it's not constantly, we're not constantly bombarding the central nervous system and the brain in particular and demanding all of that neuro power, neuron power to be, um, to be focused on every little thing. It's very energetically demanding to produce the signal, signal. So this is another way for us to reduce that energetic demand. Okay, so when we do have a stimuli or a sensation that occurs, then we're going to generate, finally, our response, which is what the two, you, you two were getting at earlier was more of the response. What's going to happen as a result of this stimuli that's just been recognized by the central nervous system? And the response, it can be a variety of different things. It's going to usually be corrective action. In this case, you're going to have relaxation of, uh, of extensors in the hand, and you're going to have contraction of the flexors to move the hand and the wrist away from that stimuli. But it may be things like increasing your blood pressure or a motor response. to move your hand or other appendage. And you could probably think of a variety of other reactions that might happen. You might start to cry. Right here. <laughs> you might start to sweat. You might have butterflies in your stomach. You might vomit. You might do a whole bunch of different things in response to the stimuli, some sort of hopefully corrective action. Now, I've already alluded to the fact that we have to deal with a lot of information. And we're actually relatively good at information processing. 
and we have four types of information that we need to deal with. And I got examples of some of these types of info. So you can see that we have modality, location, and then intensity and um, what's being called time course that I'm going to call call it duration. Okay, so this is all information that is going to help determine the type of stimuli and the repeated response to that particular stimuli. So the first is modality, and this is going to be info that is about the type of stimuli. So in other words, what the stimuli is. Is it a heat signal? Is it a light signal? Is it a pressure signal? Is it a mechanical signal? Now, from a um, electrical perspective, this is pretty interesting. The modality signal itself is often equal. And I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. So, one of our senses, it could be the sense of taste, right? Or it could be the sense of vision. Taste and vision, they provide information about our surroundings into the central nervous system so the surroundings can process that information and dictate what we need to do. Are we safe? Okay, we're going to just continue this to see. Bear walks into the door, reevaluates the situation. Are we safe? No, we're no longer safe. So if we push on right still there, and everyone else. <laughs> Two very different signals, right? What you're eating and what you're seeing, but the electrical signal is actually identical for the for each of these. Okay, so electrically identical. So how do we differentiate a signal in the brain that's coming from the eye versus coming from taste buds? And really. The answer is that we're going to not use different electrical signals, as I've highlighted here, but rather different neurons. So those two signals are going to be carried by different nerves into the central nervous system. So the modality information is frequently differentiated not by an electrical signal per se, but by where that electrical signal is transmitted from, how it's transmitted into the central nervous system. Which means that those neurons that are being used, and this is where it gets really crazy, the nerve itself, itself has some sort of intrinsic code for sensation. In other words, information about modality, about the type of stimuli, comes in a labeled line code. A labeled line code. So you can see down here at the very bottom, you have different impulses, and they come in and they kind of look like barcodes. The information about modality, depending on the nerve, the, the signal is electrically identical, but it's barcode. So we know exactly where it's coming from. So if it's the optic nerve carrying vision information, inherent to that neuron, there is a code, a line code, that's processed alongside of the data, the electrical stimuli that are coming in, so that the brain says, OK, this is information coming in from the eyes, from the optic nerve. The second type of information is location.
So what you can see down here is there's different size what are called receptive fields. And within those receptive fields, we have different distributions of certain types of sensors. So each of our receptors are housed, so to speak, in a receptive field. Now those receptive fields are basically the GPS coordinates for where those receptors are located. Is it the tip of your finger or is it the tip of your toe? Again, we call that a receptive field. In these receptive fields, we're going to, we're going to find them all over, all over the body, all over the integument. And they're going to come in different sizes. So the size of the fields are going to be different. And because of that, densities are different. And this is going to end up dictating the ability and the magnitude of that ability to sense the surroundings. It's beginning. So we have receptors that are housed in the receptive field, and then we also have this thing called the sensory projections. That's actually a B. <laughs> sensory projections are information so that we know where that particular receptive field is located. So we know where the stimuli occurs. And it is going to the, the site of stimuli, stimulation to the central nervous system that creates a pathway. So we have our receptive field, and from that receptive field, we have the sensory projection. How does the signal from that sensory field or receptive field make its way back up into the central nervous system? What path is it physically following? So the site of stimulation to the central nervous system, this is going to be called a projection pathway. Projection pathway. So we have the modality. We basically have what type of stimulus is being uh, is what type of stimulus is, is being created, what, what is the information that is being picked up, and then location, where is it coming from, and it's going to use this projection pathway to say this is coming from the tip of the finger and not from the tip of the tip. So the central nervous system is going to receive this basically metadata information about information Wrapped up in that stimuli, you're going to have what type of receptor is actually sending us this information, where is this receptor going to be located, and then we're also going to receive information on intensity. And that intensity is going to share information to the central, ner central nervous system about the amount of the stimuli.
So is this stimuli big? Is this stimuli small? What you're going to remember is action potentials don't change, right? They follow that thing called the all or none principle. So the bigger the stimuli doesn't mean the bigger the action potential. So we have to send this information, code this information in a slightly different way to pass it on to the central nervous system so the central nervous system knows something about the intensity of the stimuli. By changing the rate of stimuli, so let's say we increase the stimuli rate, this results in an increase in the sensory signal. So bigger signals are going to produce faster stimuli signals, faster rate of stimuli. Now, even though individual neurons are going to follow that all or none principle, we can activate larger and larger groups of neurons. So, you know, maybe you have a little tiny pinprick in the tip of your finger, finger and you can activate a dozen nerves. Or you cut that bad boy open with a scalpel and you involve hundreds of nerves instead of just the 12. Hundreds of neurons, I should say. So we can change the intensity by increasing the stimuli amount and accomplish this through an increase in nerve recruitment. So increasing the stimuli amount resulting in or because of an increase in the number of nerves that are recruited to send information up to the central nervous system. Modality, location, intensity, and the final one Time course or duration. So duration is going to just simply dictate how long is the stimuli. What is the length of that stimuli? And so this is going to relate in part to the temporal nature or changes in firing frequency. Now, one of the things that we need to note about the time course or the duration of a stimuli, we're dictating information on the length of the stimuli. And across a temporal landscape, we're going to have changes in the, the firing frequency. So because of this, we have what's known as sensory adaptation. That sensory adaptation basically is this idea that we are going to have, and you're actually familiar with this, and I'm going to tell you where in just a, a second. But sensory adaptation states that we're going to have a slowing of the sensory frequency with time. What this results in, as we have the slowing of frequency with time, is a reduction in the perception of a signal. So how many of you have stubbed your toe before? And like right away it hurts. You know, like, ah, I mean, everything you do is like to go and protect that toe. Five, ten minutes later, it just sort of throbs and aches just a little bit. And so you've had this temporal reduction, this sensory adaptation where the frequency of that signal being sent to the nervous system has reduced. And so the signal, the pain signal that's sent down to your toe isn't as amplified. Now, what you can see down here in this figure is these are called the neural spike trains. 
basically when are the impulses coming in, you can see that the stimuli are actually all identical. But embedded in that information, you have this barcode. You can see that the duration is going to change, and the frequency per unit time changes. It may start out really, really quick, and then we get a much lower frequency. Or a really, really high frequency, and it reduces just a little bit. Or low frequency altogether, or a very pretty consistent frequency. So those frequencies we can put into general groupings or categories. And they're going to be based off of the type of receptors that are involved. Based on this notion of sensory adaptation. So in other words, the response, the barcode, the way that barcode responds is going to be different for different receptors. And I'd like you to be familiar with two different types of receptors. The first will be a phasic receptor. And the phasic receptor, you're going to have a burst of signals. And then that burst is going to be quickly stopped. Or if it's not stopped, at least reduced. So a receptor that follows the sensory adaptation called phasic reception. You get this initial burst of signal sent into the central nervous system. And then you have this reduction in the signal. And so it comes kind of in these phases. Burst and then silence. Burst and then silence. Your receptors for smell are going to follow this phasic reception quickly stopped or reduced. The second category or grouping is tonic reception. Now with tonic reception, it's not phasic. It doesn't come in these pulses or phases. It's steady. So more like what we have here, and even to a certain degree, this, this one and this one here. So we're going to have this steady nerve signal. And you're actually still going to see some change, but it's going to be much slower, right? That basic reception, it's really quick as it changes. So you get that signal coming in in those bursts, and then it releases down the signal. Tonic, it's going to occur more steady, so it's going to be a steady nerve signal, but the frequency may change, so it's not just like always coming in at the exact same frequency. You still have flexibility, but it's much slower to adapt. So examples here. Think about smell. Right? If we were to open up, I don't know, rotten milk in here, you'd be like, ah. Oh. But relatively soon it goes away, right? It's not as potent. And that's because you get this initial burst and then the signal kind of diminishes. Fast response. The proprioception. So the example here is proprioception, which deals with basically sensing of the muscle's position. It 
is going to happen tonically. If you start to stretch your arm, you're going to feel that pull. That sense, sensory signal is going to continue because it's tonic. It's not basic. It's not going to eventually go away. Now, there are ways to trick that. And we can talk a little more about that if you're interested. But you know, you think about it. When you go down to stretch, that information being sent into the brain is dealing with the position of your muscle, and it doesn't slowly dissipate. You're always aware that you're stretching, right? So proprioception, proprio, proprioception follows the tonic receptor mode. Because we're dealing with the sensing of the muscles in position. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about some of the specific types of sensor, um, sense receptors or sensors that we have. Um, so basically, this idea here is what are the things that we can respond to? Can we respond to ultraviolet light? We can't sense ultraviolet light, but we can sense visible light. And the reason is, is because we have a photoreceptor that responds to visible light. We have a organ or a system of receptors that helps us to determine wavelengths of light to be able to respond. So specific types of receptor, we have the thermoreceptors. These respond to heat and cold. As I just mentioned, we have photoreceptors that help us to respond to light. We have this interesting receptor called a nociceptor, which is a pain and tissue damage receptor. So if you cut yourself, you're going to involve nociceptors. We also have chemo receptors. And we're going to run into some chemo receptors when we talk about the circulatory system later this semester. This is going to be set, uh, receptors that can detect changes in chemicals, both the internal and external environments. And then we have mechanical receptors. Which are going to be able to uh, dictate and protect, I should say, mechanical forces and pressure and tension. So obviously things like photoreceptors are going to be located in sensory organs like the eye. Chemoreceptors, some of our smell comes from chemoreceptors containing certain chemical uh, and, and uh, uh, functional groups on, on certain types of molecules and aromats and things like that. But we're also going to find chemoreceptors in places like the circulatory system, keep, keeping track of concentrations of ions in the bloodstream. So those are just functional groupings. We have some other groupings as well, because biologists love to put things into categories. And these other groups 
are going to be based off of things like the external stimuli. Where does the stimuli come from? Is it external environment, or is it coming from internal environments such as the organs? And so we may have a nociceptor that is also an exteroceptor, which is a receptor that responds to external stimuli. Interoceptors that sense stimuli to internal environment and internal organs in particular. Already used the term proprioceptors. Proprioceptors, they don't just occur necessarily in the muscle, but a proprioceptor is a receptor that senses position and movement. And then the last kind of other grouping here are going to be somato sensors. So a somatosensory receptor is a wide area of receptors. Typically, these are receptors that we find out in the, out in the body, hence its name, in their sensory system. Proprioceptors. Monitors the position of joints and muscles. Now, all of these receptors, they end up in a variety of different places. And you probably heard before that we have five special senses. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What? In reality, humans have many more senses than just five, which touch taste, hearing, sight, and smell are the classic kind of special senses. Those special senses are the ones that are collected up in the head, with the exception of touch. So within your head, you're going to have your vision ability, your hearing ability, taste, and smell. Touch is another example. Pain is another example of a special sense. So the ones that you've learned with the exception of touch are simply located in the head. They're actually arguing the body that are located in your head, but the fifth one is not touch. It's actually going to be equilibrium. Equilibrium and balance. 